Is that right, huh? Oh, yeah. Very, Thank very you. nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Italy, Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you Let me uh, refine my notes here. There you are. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, well. Yes. Uh, yes, sure. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Mm, no, actually, uh, I mean, I, I've got some numbers here. I'll give you the Spain, Italy, Singapore, Switzerland. Italy, Singapore, Switzerland. I think I took those notes from the EIA report. Um, but there's, you know, it depends on depends on the source of the numbers and sometimes it, it depends yeah, yeah.
Mexico has the benefit of being the last to reform. And get the benefit from all the other people who the mistakes made. Please take a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to uh, the third panel of this uh, North American uh, Energy Forum. Uh, we're looking now, turning to the sector of uh, electricity. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, with us uh, two very distinguished guests. Um, on the, my far left, uh, John Renahan, who is the Director of Strategy for GE Power and Water. Um, uh, he joined GE in 2007, and he served in distinct role, di different roles, including wind operations, solar product line, commercial operations, European solar development. Um, John has a, uh, has a long trajectory in this, uh, in this field. He has an MBA from the Johnson School at Cornell University um, and holds a BA in leadership studies from the Jepson School of Leadership at the University of Richmond. Uh, John, thank you for being with us. It's great to see you again. And I'm particularly delighted to, uh, to welcome uh, a dear friend of, of ours and, and myself personally, uh, Under Secretary for Electricity from Mexico, Cesar Hernandez. Um, Cesar Hernandez was appointed as Under Secretary for Electricity uh, by President Enrique Peña Nieto in February of 2014. Previously, he was the head of CENER's Legal Affairs uh, Unit, uh, uh, Secretary of the Board of Directors of Pemex, and Secretary of the Governing Board of CFE, uh, which has been a particularly, I mean, demanding positions all the way through. But you've been witness to so much of the, the process of the energy reform, the planning process as well. I remember particularly, you know, your insights on the legality of co whether constitutional reforms were actually needed to make the change happen. And in the end, they, the constitutional reforms did happen. And uh, you know, so it's been an extraordinary process. Um, Cesar is a, is a graduate of UNAM's law faculty, has a master's degree in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a PhD in law from, from UNAM. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us uh, here today. I'd like to begin with you, Under Secretary, uh, and if I can ask you, you know, obviously Mexico has gone, gone through this extraordinary change at the moment, and a lot of the focus internationally has been on the oil and gas sector, for obvious reasons. But my own perspective is that the electricity reform is just as important, if not more important, particularly in the short term for Mexico. I think we're about to see an extraordinary change because of the electricity reform uh, in terms of the impact upon competitiveness, the impact uh, upon investment in the sector, and the modernization of the sector. I wonder if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about you know, the, the scale of that reform in the, in the electricity sector the investment opportunities to there that, that are there and, and the challenges that exist. Sure. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure being here at the Wilson Center, to John and, and Duncan, who is an old friend, as, as he mentioned briefly, who had a lot of discussions earlier on whether or not Mexico needed a constitutional reform. I was arguing that it didn't, but then uh, it took my luck took me to implement and to try to push for a constitutional reform, so <laughs> I ended up doing what Duncan advocated the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, as Duncan said, and, and as I agree with him, uh, electricity reform is, if uh, not as important, probably even more important than oil and gas reform in Mexico. The reason is basically that Mexico... Well, both sectors were the last sectors of Mexico's economy that were close to private investment. While Mexico had been very open to uh, foreign trade, to, to in, in every measure, the Mexico's economy was very open, 
it, it remained closed in energy, in oil and gas, and in, in electricity. And those, those were the sectors where most of the new opportunities for growth were untapped, where, where a lot of potential could be uh, uh, achieved and uh, uh, taken advantage of in, in the next years. Uh, Mexico, uh, after NAFTA was signed uh, at the early 90s, uh, became a manufacturing nation. In, in, in the two decade, decades that passed, Mexico became a huge manufacturing base for many American companies, for many transnational companies, and the exports of manufacturing of Mexico alone are uh, bigger than those of the rest of Latin America added. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, all the rest of the countries export less and much less manufac uh, uh, manufacturing products than Mexico does. So for that sector and for that uh, part of the economy, energy is a vital component. And Mexico became component, uh, competitive without having access to cheap energy, b b without having access to good uh, electricity rates or to gas or, or to other things. So when you free that part of the economy, it really does provide a boost f for one sector that is already very competitive in Mexico. Uh, a month and a half ago, a couple of months ago, the CEO of Siemens Corporation went to Mexico and he made uh, probably uh, some sort of publicity, but he said, well, I think the, the three greatest manufacturing nations in 50 years will be Germany, uh, China, and Mexico. And that, uh, it's uh, probably an overstatement or anything, but it does give you a sense of a, of the type of potential that you could uh, achieve in the country if you deal with that. Earlier this year, uh, 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 a think tank, the McKinsey Global Institute, published uh, a report on Mexico, which was called Mexico, uh, uh, no, A Tale of Two Mexicos. And it identified five uh, elements that they said were lagging Mexico's competitiv competitiveness. And one of them was basically electricity rates. It said, if Mexico can deal with lower in electricity rates, uh, it can do a lot about overcoming its competitive not problems. And uh, what the electricity reform is basically uh, does is basically free that potential. It incorporates uh, best international practices. It's crea it creates an independent system operator. It, uh, it, it is going to create a spot market that will work according to um, what we thought were the best practices of several uh, of the regional systems in the US. And uh, it's a process in which uh, a lot of untapped uh, uh, sources of, uh, of competitiveness will be uh, will be taken advantage of. There are, there are lots of opportunities for importing energy from the states, which is cheaper in Texas. A lot of opportunities for exporting energy to uh, electricity to Central America. A, a lot of inefficient old plants uh, in Mexico's electricity system that could be replaced by renewables or by uh, gas-fired combined cycle uh, centrals. The, the, uh, the grid is very it's not very dense, it's very weak in many parts, so there are lots of opportunities for improving that. And in the whole process, there are uh, the, the fact that the reform allows different forms of private participation uh, to, uh, to take place according to best international practices, that should uh, mean that lots of investment take place in Mexico in the next years, and costs of electricity are driven down uh, very, uh, very fast and in, in ways that that have repercussions throughout the whole economy. So that's what I think the potential of electricity reform uh, is for Mexico and, and the meaning for, for, for the country in the next years. Thank you. I wonder if I could just ask you one follow-up question here before we move on to John, which is about you know, what you were talking about, the CENASE, the independent uh, you know, grid operator. Um, how is that going to interact with private firms in terms of you know offering capacity and also in terms of building new capacity and and you know a connected question you know, if you look behind you on the screen we have this wonderful chart that Shirley Neff presented about you know cross border connections for oil e electricity and natural gas yes. you know that question that you mentioned of you know cross border trade and electricity yes. which has huge potential where do you see the opportunities are there okay first the SENACE, the independent system operator, was created uh, um, 
to uh, solve a problem of conflict of interest. Because uh, as a part of CFE, of Mexico's National Electricity Com uh, uh, Company, the Senase dealt with all the interconnection applications uh, by its private competitors. So there was a, a huge conflict of interest between Senase as part of CFE and the private operators that tried to enter Mexico's market. And many times their applications were basically denied or uh, a lot of technical obstacles were found that uh, meant that new uh, uh, power, uh, private p power generation plants could not be actually connected to the grid. So uh, what the reform did was basically create a separate legal entity, transfer all the equipment, the personnel, and uh, uh, and the apparatus that CFE had at Senase, and uh, and put it on the under the direction of a new director, which came from outside CFE, and that was accomplished in the first month after the 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 le le secondary legislation was published, and after that, lots of applications came to connect to the grid, and they didn't come to CFE but rather to Senase, and a lot of them have been found to ha have been found to have merits and have been dealt with uh, both in a more efficient way and in a less costly way for private applicants. Uh, for instance, uh, where one applicant would be, uh, uh, its application would be considered and said, well, you need to construct this line and you need to, to construct this substation and all that. Uh, in the new process, you aggregate all the uh, applicants and you say, well, the five of you need to construct this line and build one uh, uh, substation, but that's, uh, it shares the costs, it, it makes it much, much, much more easier to, to, to really incorporate this energy. So that's one big change. You uh, basically have a more streamlined procedures, a, a more economically efficiently designed ways of connecting to the grid, and that's already happening. The Senase will publish the new interconnection guidelines uh, during the month of November. So, uh, and that should codify those procedures and give certainty to private investors who want to connect to the grid. As regards uh, uh, import of energy from the United States, the uh, secondary legislation provided for some interim rules uh, to be published by the month of November. They have been in public consultation during uh, the month of November. They were, uh, the draft was uh, presented by the Mexico's energy regulator, the Energy Regulatory Commission, mm -hmm. and they should be published also by the end of the month. So that should give certainty to some projects, some of which are already in, in the pipeline, that want to uh, uh, bring energy from Texas, ship energy to Mexico. Mexico's uh, interconnections with the state, with, with the U.S., are still weak, mm -hmm. as they are with Guatemala. Mexico was not very well connected to the outside world in, in the past years. But uh, the new legislation should also make it much easier to build these, uh, these lines. And the incentives are already there because uh, you have huge price differentials between uh, both regions, both between Mexico and the States and between Mexico and Guatemala, for instance, or Central America in general. So uh, a, a lot of opportunity for, for a good trading relationship exists, and what they need is stable rules, which I think we are doing the job of trying to provide in, uh, in a fast way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. John, turning to you and, and turning from sort of the, you know, the, the Mexico-specific picture here to the region, you know, GE is a company that has uh, extensive interest, shall we say, in all three of the energy markets of, of North America. What is, is, is your uh, outlook on the, you know, in terms of the needs for infrastructure across the region? Where do you see the most exciting opportunities? Um, and not just in terms of, you know, traditional generation, traditional transmission, but other kinds of new technologies that are out there. Yeah, so so I'm on the team that that leads strategic planning for Power and Water, and and Power and Water for us is a business that covers all technologies from combined cycle gas turbines to nuclear, to to big renewables like wind. Um, so we get to see the full gamut of technologies. And one of the things I, I thought I'd do with you this morning was just kind of share our outlook over the next ten years and and what what we see in North America in terms of what technologies will mm -hmm. be installed. And you know, one of the privileges that we have in, in the US and in Mexico and Canada, and you heard it from the earlier panels, is just the access to fuel availability. And, and it really, whether it be gas, whether it be renewables the, like solar and wind, that just, it's a game changer for us in, in really driving market mechanisms, policies, making technology investments that, that really lower those infrastructure costs and make us you know, 
probably one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive region in the whole world when it comes to electricity costs. So what we see going on in Mexico, some of the progressive policies there in the U.S. and in Canada, it's really setting us up for an incredible future when we look at the investment that's going in. Um, and I, I thought I'd touch on a, a few themes. I mean, the age of gas is, is something that you hear all the time. You heard it in the, in the last panel. But that's a game changer. I mean, and it's not just a U.S. story. It's, it's happening in Mexico. I think we'll see the continued investment there in that infrastructure build out of those pipelines. But I liked how you, you hit on, too, just the, the distributed side of the infrastructure, too, because at the end of the day, what businesses need, what you know, individual consumers needs is, is cheaper electricity. You, you, know, you can spend more money elsewhere. From an industrial standpoint, when we talk to you know, commercial customers in, in Europe or other parts of the world, I mean, they're jealous of the uh, electricity costs in, in North America and, and are making you know, some big moves to move production over here. And I, and I heard this uh, uh, figure recently, which is that by far and away, the fastest growing area of North American exports are energy intensive exports yeah. for the simple reason that energy is so much cheaper here. Yep. So, so over the next decade um, across North America, so US, Canada, and Mexico, we see 215 gigawatts being installed. I mean, Mexico alone has a gig, uh, installed base of about 66 gigawatts. We see in the next decade another 40 gigawatts mm -hmm. going in. US, you know, we expect another 140 gigawatts, and Canada, probably another 35 gigawatts. So again, this is big investments, and this is on the, the wholesale side of, of capacity. Um, so it's from a technology standpoint, we're really excited about it and, and thinking about where we allocate our resources to make sure that we can help our, our customers and our partners. I'd say the other trend that, that is when we talk to, you know, whether it be customers, whether it be governments, that people are surprised by is just the cost of renewables now. They are economic, um, you know, wind, wind for, for a long time has been very economic in Mexico. Mexico has always been progressive on the, on the wind front. Same thing with the U.S. I mean, it's, it, the installed base of wind in the U.S. is 65 gigawatts now. Um, so these are huge numbers. It's not some fringe technology that, you know, people are trying out. The, the cost of solar and wind, solar alone, the costs have gone, come down 75% in the last five years. In wind, the costs of wind have come down 70% in the last decade. So these are reliable mainstream technologies now. And then I'd say that the third thing that really excites us and, and we've been sharing a lot of stories about and, and people are interested in is just asset productivity around brilliant machines. You hear the term big data all the time. And data is great, but what do you actually do with it? You know, can you use that data to have smarter power plants? Can you have that data to really connect the dots and, and have a more efficient grid? And so that's a huge frontier that we see, you know, that, that, that we're bullish on and, and want to be on the forefront on. But that's, that's a game changer. And, and one of the things that we were talking about before is Mexico's in a great position because you can learn from the rest of the world. Um, as you implement your own policies and, and think about where to invest, you don't have to make maybe some of the mistakes of, of other countries. And then if you, if you jump to the next slide, um, I, I just thought I'd take a couple minutes um, where I've been investing a lot of time and our team's been investing a lot of time. And to follow up on your question, Duncan, on what's next, or in some cases, what's already here. Um, so these are some of the, the disruptors are out that, that are out there. So um, I, I think one of the things that important to us, there's so much information out there that a lot of what our team does is, is try to ground the internal GE team in reality. Because you can read press releases, and, and what does it mean? Is this stuff real? Is it here now? Wh what do we do about it? So I thought I'd hit on, on five. Um, you know, on-site power, you see it with your in the industrials all over the world. People need electricity and energy is a controllable cost. Mm -hmm. And downtime for factories, downtime for businesses is just too much of a business risk. And so a lot of businesses want their own more reliable source of power. They also want it to be more cost effective. So combined heat and power is a great resource for industrials, for hospitals, that just makes economic sense today. So, you know, 80% plus efficiencies when you think about combined heat and power. Another one that's, that's big is, is just uh, on-site, you know, data and analytics. I mean, it's unbelievable what you can do now with just take something as simple as an LED light bulb. 
I mean, we in our, in our house, I have, I have three little kids, and lights can be on and off. Some, installing something as simple as an LED light bulb can save 80% you know, of, of what you were spending before on, on electricity. And again, LED light bulbs, have the cost has come down considerably. You can get them for $4 now, whereas a few years ago they were $15, $20, sometimes more. Um, HVAC, you know, think about, and, and people aren't having to make behavioral changes. Yeah. You know, the, this is stuff that you can install in your home that is automated and you don't need to do anything about it. Same thing with businesses and buildings. I mean, just software and, and controls alone are making huge improvements in the efficiency of our overall system. The world spends $400 billion a year on equipment that generates electrons and servicing that electron. But the, maybe the more impressive stat is the world also spends $3 trillion a year on electricity costs alone. So that's what the end consumers pay. So that's something that, that we all need to, to work towards and you know, think about because it's, it's so important to our overall economic viability to make sure that that's as efficient as possible. Rooftop solar is another a trend that we pay a lot of attention to. I think the, the game changer lately in rooftop solar has just been the innovative business models, the fact that you don't necessarily have to own the system, that you can, it can be leased. I think the struggle there and, and challenge for people is it's confusing. You know, is, is this a, a system that's going to be re reliable for 20 years? And then I, I think the other thing that, that people don't always realize is that you still need the grid. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not something that... It's great. I have, I have solar on my roof. I'm, I'm good now. I don't, I don't need my utility. I mean, you need both. Yeah. Um, we count on a reliable grid that's dependable, that's affordable. And so the, the grid's not going anywhere. But in some places, solar makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then, the, you know, the only other one I'd, I'd touch on is just energy storage. Again, that's, that's a game changer both on the grid side and also behind the meter. Behind the meter in California, energy storage makes sense today. In, in a lot of places just because of the demand charges people play. But the costs still need to come way down yeah. in energy storage to make it, you know, to reach the scale that it could. I mean, the costs need to come down another 40% to make it a real viable solution that you can scale. Is there something on the horizon for energy storage? I mean, you know, battery power, that, that's some, that's some kind of disruptive technology that's out there that we haven't heard about yet or that maybe some people in the room haven't heard of, and I, I haven't, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I think there... Um, you know, everybody's making in investments all the time. A lot of it is just, again, when Tesla made their investment in their gigawatt factory, uh -huh. that, that announcement alone doubled global supply of lithium-ion batteries. <laughs> so so I, just like you saw with solar, scale will be important, but also just the applications and design of that overall system is, is critical because it's not just the battery alone, it's the controls, it's the software. How does it work together? And, and maybe how does it work with a a traditional technology like a combined cycle gas turbine or a wind turbine. I mean, in Texas, we're combining storage with, with wind to make, you know, wind kind of predictable power that you can project what it's going to deliver 15 minutes out. So it's how do you look at the whole, whole system and how the different technologies work together, which I think is the real game changer. And it's, uh, in some ways, it's, it's the holy grail, the El Dorado that's out there, yeah. isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I remember an article back in the early 2000s, I guess, uh, was it Reginald Smalls who wrote that uh, article called The Terawatt Challenge? Mm -hmm. And he said that that's, that's the dream, is that, you know, one day in our homes we have something about the size of a refrigerator that is the battery that can store the electricity that you generate from your building, yeah. you know, in all different kinds of ways, including, you know, re classic renewable energy. And then at nighttime when you come home, you just basically switch it on and there's your electricity. That, that would change everything, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Cesar, if I can come back to you before we, we open up for questions. You know, in Mexico, we're waiting to uh, see what the sort of the green package is going to come through in, in, in Mexico. At some point, you know, in the new year, we hope to see that, uh, that legislation. Um, you know, what do you predict is, is going to come out of that? And I know you can't sort of, you know, sort of get out your crystal ball, but what are the things that we'd like to see from a, a legislative package, that, you know, including questions like energy efficiency? Sure. Um, when Mexico passed the constitutional amendment uh, last year, uh, when it made basically to the uh, transitory articles, uh, basically said in six months we'll have a package of secondary legislation which implements this constitutional amendment. And it also said in one year we'll have a green package, one which deals with uh, energy efficiency, with all uh, the uh, transition of, um, to more renewable sources and everything. And uh, until now we have kept our promises. So, and I think we'll also make good on the promise of having 
a new law of energy transition, which is uh, uh, basically what has been discussed. Um, a, an, an initiative, one, uh, a bill was uh, presented by the uh, National Action Party, the PAN, uh, at the end of last year, and it stayed there. It has not been processed, but uh, we'll probably start working on that uh, in the same way with it, with the other parts of the package of reforms, which is basically uh, a negotiating team between uh, legislators and uh, public officials to try to reach a, a final bill by by the date that was set as the objective in the constitutional amendment, which is the 21st of, of December. What should we hope for in that bill? What was included in the PAN bill was basically a set of uh, uh, measures designed to strengthen. Uh, Mexico has two uh, agencies which deal with energy efficiency and which are actually very successful, very modern in their outlook, although they are old, they were created 20 years ago which is what is the CONUE, the uh, Commission on, on Energy Efficiency. It's done lots of good things for public buildings, for the public administration to promote uh, energy measures, to have a good inventory of what every uh, office is consuming in electricity. It also does a good work in uh, the whole normalization process, creating good technical standards and uh, introducing norms to be uh, applied by the industry. So at this law, one of the things it will do is strengthen that organism. Another agency which is also uh, going to be strengthened is the uh, Institute for Research on Electricity, which actually is a part of CFE. And a process such as what we saw in the independent system operator will also take place there. It's all moving from a monopoly to a, a different institutional setup in, in Mexico's energy. But in this case, basically, this institute, which did work basically for for the CFE, for, for our national electricity company, will be doing work for the whole industry, also promoting uh, research on, on, this, uh, on these areas. There are a series of centers for innovation in renewable technologies, which were created uh, in the last years in an, in an informal way, and uh, uh, the reform will also institutionalize that. They will also incorporate uh, uh, the, uh, some of the elements that were already present in a couple of, of laws uh, that had been passed in the last five years by the Calderon administration. Uh, so it's a process which is open-ended, but it will be uh, trying to incorporate best practices on energy efficiency on some of the issues that, that were discussed. I I only want to uh, add a couple of things, um, just uh, you know, taking advantage of, of what John said before. One of the big reasons for us to move into uh, to, to a model of electricity market is basically that it's uh, a better institutional environment for innovation and for, techno for, for new technologies to be introduced. And uh, in the electricity industry law, there are uh, many... Uh, provisions regarding the use of distributed energy, giving rights to, to the users to introduce this type of, or, or, or to providers to introduce these types of technologies, give, giving them some certainty on what the rates they will be paid if they feed their energy to the grid. Um, and the whole system is more uh, amicable to introducing new technologies such as, as some of the game changers that were talked about before. So it's uh, in general, I think we are creating a, a good environment, an institutional environment for uh, for innovation to be introduced and for technological advancements to be introduced in Mexico in the next years. Thank you. That's uh, kind of a perfect link into uh, an event that we're actually kicking off tonight here at the Wilson Center, which is where we have uh, 25 federal legislators from Mexico to come up and talk about innovation. So I'm going to bring up this example with them in our discussions tomorrow. Please, can I uh, see questions from the floor? Hand up over here, one here, and one here. Joe, uh, Joe Martin, University of Toronto. Two questions, one re-Canada and second re-Mexico. Uh, I'm puzzled as to why there wasn't a Canadian on this panel, given the amount of electricity that's sold in the Northeast. In terms of Mexico, I didn't quite understand the point. You talked about the terrific increase in manufacturing since the signing of NAFTA, and then you said something about the price of electricity, but I didn't quite understand what you said. Sure. Um, would you like to address the Canadian first? <laughs> <laughs>
as, a, as el responsable, the person up on the stage. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we had a very tough time identifying uh, a, a Canadian electricity provider who was willing to come down and talk about this at this point in time. We worked closely with the Canadian embassy, but it wasn't possible to, to solve that problem. So I'm afraid you're going to have to wait until next year's second annual energy forum to actually hear the Canadian's perspective on this. But, uh, you know, I have no doubt that John probably has some perspectives on, uh, on what's going on in Canada and, uh, and the opportunities that are, that are there. Excellent. Well, regarding Mexico's uh, manufacturing base, Mexico, before the signing of NAFTA, was basically a country that had a system of import substitution, and our manufacturing industry was not very competitive. After the signing of NAFTA, many uh, U.S. and international companies moved their bases of operation to Mexico and started to produce manufactured goods in Mexico. Many large uh, uh, automotive companies started to manufacture cars there. And it did really introduce a, a big change into Mexico's economy. It became export-driven, and uh, the, the larger size of exports were bas basically manufactured products. At first, some were very as basically assembled in Mexico, but then they moved on to incorporate more local content. And in some cases, such as in the auto industry, it really, uh, Mexico became very competitive as a place to build, not only to assemble cars, but to build it and, and, to, uh, and to get all the procurement locally and, and everything. And that's a process that has been ongoing. Uh, those uh, types of uh, factories consume a lot of electricity, a lot of gas and everything. And electricity prices in Mexico, in the industrial sector, are 80% uh, uh, higher than in the U.S., and probably it's uh, not the best international comparison because the U.S. has such low prices in electricity, thanks to markets and, and, to, and to technological innovation and, and to things like that. But it's relevant because uh, basically uh, Mexico could only compete with low labor costs. As the process of modernization of Mexico's industry went on, it became more competitive uh, every time, and uh, labor costs went up, but then energy costs became the, the big issue. So uh, what I'm, uh, what we, one of the main reasons, and basically the main reason for arguing for an, uh, uh, an energy sector reform in Mexico, not only for electricity, but for the whole oil and gas sector, is the promise that President Peña Nieto made to, to the population that this reform would mean lower prices. People, the Mexico's population, were not concerned about uh, the competitiveness of Pemex or CFE or uh, corrupt practices. Or they wanted to see the reform be translated into something they could feel in their pockets, and that was a lower uh, electricity bill. And that's how in, in the spots, the TV spots that were uh, uh, put in television all the time, basically they said energy reform will mean lower prices for, for everyone. That was also although it was not voiced, it was a bigger concern for commercial users of electricity, which pay almost double the rates that U.S. Co uh, uh, commerce pays, a small CBS or the equivalent in Mexico pays huge electricity bills, and for industry, which, as I said, paid uh, very, very high bills. Some of the larger manufacturing uh, companies were able to generate their own electricity and thus escapes the r escape the rates pay, uh, charged by the CFE. But lots of them couldn't do, smaller industries couldn't do that. So the biggest impact, I think, of electricity reform will be lowering the rates that all these uh, sectors, huge sectors of Mexico's economy are paying and thus making them more competitive. It will, as the reform in trade, the, the fact that after NAFTA we received goods from the states and from all over the world at cheaper prices, which is one of the biggest differences between Mexico and Brazil, that uh, in Mexico you can actually live an, on a lot less um, when you have these purchasing power parity, uh, parity uh, comparisons, really Mexico's per capita GDP goes up as compared with Brazil. Uh, one of the sectors where we don't have that advantage is energy. And we are betting that this reform will help us get cheaper energy, uh, uh, bring lots of investments, bring lots of untapped energy uh, sources and advantages. One of the cases, for instance, uh, uh, is cogen. Uh, Pemex has a huge uh, potential for cogen, and it has not been uh, tapped. It has uh, uh, recently unveiled a plan to generate 
five gigawatts in the next four years. And it's doing it with old infrastructure which was not used, where steam was basically wasted into the atmosphere. It was not taken advantage of. And what it did basically was sign a couple of joint ventures with uh, several private companies, where the only thing Pemex does is put its old infrastructure and get the private party to put the investment to introduce the changes so as to generate electricity with energy that was previously not used, heat or, or steam. So uh, that's just one of the examples of, of the many opportunities that are ripe uh, in Mexico for if, if someone wants to take advantage of them. And they combine very well into the needs of that Mexico has for, to, to expand its manufacturing potential. Um, just, just to reinforce a couple of things that the Undersecretary said, I mean, you know, there have been several examples over the past couple of years of companies that have made the decision not to invest in Mexico but to invest in the United States, and the deciding factor was the price of energy. And then the point about, you know, impacting upon people's uh, spending, you know, on the, on, the, on the purse, you know, backing up what John has mentioned earlier on, in some parts of northern Mexico, in the town of Mexicali, for example, some people are spending up to one-third of their income on electricity because of the high rates of electricity, if you consume more than a certain amount, your prices go up for the entire consumption. So in the town of Mexicali, which has you know, such extreme heat, people need to have that air conditioning on all the time, and that means that they pay a fortune in electricity bills. So bringing those down is going to actually have a, a big, big impact upon people's standard of living. Question back here in the middle. Thank you. My name is Thomas Grindley. What are the latest developments in combined cycle technology? I understand that this is applicable to both natural gas and coal gasification. Thank you. Combined cycle technology, latest developments. Yes. So, so on Monday, I, we have a manufacturing uh, plant in, in Greenville, South Carolina. And I was there on Monday um, kind of with our PowerGen products team. So one of the most exciting things from, from a GE perspective is we have a brand new high efficiency gas tur turbine that's the biggest in the world and also most efficient in the world. It's over 61% combined cycle efficiency. So from an internal standpoint, our teams are, are thrilled about it. Our sales guys can't talk enough about it. <laughs> you know, you got, almost have to hold them back with, with customers because they're so excited about it. Um, so that's, that's a big development. For us, I mean, when we look at, again, it comes down to economics with, with these combined cycle gas turbines is that in the U.S. and other countries around the world, it's, it's a replacement. You know, you look at the customer economics of installing this, this new gas turbine, and it just it makes economic sense. You're going to save on fuel costs. Um, you're going to run it more. It's, it pencils so well, and, and so it helps our customers and, and ultimately helps to deliver lower cost of electricity to to end consumer. So that's, a, that's an exciting development for us. And, but again, we're privileged <laughs> in North America to have access to that gas. Um, ar around the world, you don't always have that, that privilege. Um, so we also see, you know, on, on the flip side, when you don't have natural gas, you might have reciprocating engines um, that, are, that are still powered. 90% of the world's um, kind of recips are still powered by diesel which is a stat that, that surprises a lot of people. So, so from a technology standpoint, I think you'll only see continued improvement uh, with the combined cycle technology. But it's, it's huge investments. I mean, it's not, it's not something, it's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it's GE's largest investment in a, in a product. Excellent. I remember w when we saw each other in New York a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, we participated on two different panels. One was on oil and gas. That's the one I was on. And you were on the electricity side of things. And, you know, we were talking about what the future holds. And oil and gas was kind of well, pretty much the same over the next 10 years. There may be some advances. We went over to speak to the electricity guys, and they were like, no, everything's going to change. And it was, it was remarkable. It was that capacity on the electricity side to really to innovate and to, and to come up with new technologies that are going to sort of change the calculation in terms of cost. Uh, yeah, one question here, and then one towards the back. Uh, Sergey Kostev, Financial University, Moscow, Russia. My question is to uh, John. Uh, what's uh, the future of uh, nuclear energy in the United States? You mentioned that nuclear is also under your review. Well, especially we remember that there was a Fukushima disaster, and if I am not mistaken, maybe I'm wrong, uh, GE was actually uh, building that plant, right? Uh, so uh, what's the future of nuclear energy in the United States? Thanks. 
Thanks. I'm, I'm just going to take uh, prerogative and take three questions uh, in, in a row because we'll join them together there. So, yeah, why don't we just go back on this three here? Yes, Walter Earl, NDU. Uh, my question is, um, what, um, what for the Undersecretary, what are the uh, possibilities for greater integration with the uh, Central American electric uh, grid? Hello, Antonio Carvia from Georgetown University. My question is to Undersecretary Hernandez. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk to us about the um, clean ener energy certificates. I mean, the guidelines have already been uh, published, but um, I don't really understand uh, who will be the, the participants obligated to buy these uh, certificates and how exactly is the wholesale, wholesale market going to work and what's the role of Senase in, the, uh, in regulating these clean energy certificates. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you want to lead off? Yes, sir. So the, the question around nuclear, again, it's, it's like any question you answer for energy. It depends on, on what country and region you're in. Over the next decade globally, we expect about 190 gigawatts of new nuclear to get installed. So that's a, a big number. Um, but a lot of those installs are going to happen in India and China. Mm -hmm. so, so that from a U.S. standpoint, I'm looking at my stats in North America stat. Um, I think we'll only see about five to six gigawatts of new nuclear installed over the next decade in, in North America. Um, but again, the, from a technology standpoint, things keep advancing. The, the Fukushima, I mean, I, I'd say the big change or what happened there is just to increase the safety standard. So the, the cost of nuclear has gone up um, since that. And again, it, it just depends. I, th I think it's a viable fuel source, and, and you need a mix of everything, but it depends on the, the policy, and, and we don't have our, our BlackRock guy. Financing is a huge issue, yeah. too, in, in making it happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, sure. As regards um, Central America, I think that um, I recently went with uh, Secretary Joaquin to Guatemala, and there is a a lot of thirst in, in Central America uh, for cheaper electricity from Mexico. The, the relationship is pretty much like Mexico's with the United States, that you have Texas generating electricity very cheaply, and in Mexico at, more, at, higher, at higher prices. In uh, Central America, they, they have even higher prices. Most of the electricity they generate, they use diesel or fuel oil, so it's... Uh, Although they have some hydro, which is important, uh, the rest of the electricity they generated with very high, uh, expensive uh, fuels. So uh, the w there are several talks of uh, selling more electricity to, to Central America. Traditionally, and uh, it's also been impacted by the energy reform in Mexico. Traditionally, most of the trading has had been done by CFE. They sold cheaper electricity to Guatemala, and Guatemala... Uh, since it's also connected with the rest of Central America, re, uh, Sold it resold on. the electricity to the rest of the uh, Central American countries at a higher price. So they, 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 there was some arbitrage there. Uh, the talks that have been conducted in, in the last years are basically for uh, having a full interconnection between Mexico and all uh, and the Central America transmission line, which they constructed in the last 10 years through difficult diplomatic efforts. And that should uh, be make it possible to sell electricity throughout the whole Central American region. Also, another thing that is changing is basically that CFE, which have, uh, was the only seller to Guatemala, has lost that uh, position as a result of uh, Mexico's energy reform. And there are some private generators in Mexico who are private guys who are selling electricity to, uh, to, to Guatemala's system. So that's, uh, there's also more competition for, for the market. So Mexico's reform has an impact in Central America, and we're already seeing that in the demand for uh, a, a fuller interconnection and in competition between providers in Mexico to sell cheaper electricity to Central America. Uh, as regards the other question uh, regarding the clean energy certificates in Mexico, the uh, one of the biggest changes that was brought by the new electricity industry law was basically making the uh, consumers responsible for complying with the energy uh, the clean energy uh, uh, goals set by by the government so uh, whereas before the incentives were put on the on the generators now it's basically the qualified consumers 
and the suppliers of energy, the, 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 the providers that give the service to the private households and, and everyone, who have to comply with this, the, the goal that we set uh, every year. Uh, the way the system works according to the new electricity industry law is that in the first three months of each year, we set basically the mandatory percentage of clean energy that has to be consumed by all qualified users three years after we set the goal, so as to give some incentive for new uh, projects to be built and uh, to make it possible to comply with these goals. Uh, we have not set our first goal. We will set it by March next year, probably. We will have to do a lot of planning and calculations to see what is reasonable uh, for the goal. Uh, several of the regulatory agencies will be involved in the process of making the system work. Uh, the clean energy certificates are actually Mexico's first mandatory uh, system, first uh, system that has enforceable means to, to, to make uh, uh, the, all the participants comply with this, with this uh, whereas before we had some uh, goals which were hopeful that we hoped that we would get to this uh, percentage of renewals in Mexico by the year uh, X and such, uh, now it will be you know, mandatory goals that have to be complied with. SENACE will be uh, the, the institution in charge of, uh, of trading these, these instruments. Uh, CRE, which is the Energy Regulatory Commission, will be the one that certifies uh, and gives the certificates to the generators that generate with clean energy. It's a, it's a system that is modeled on renewable portfolio standard systems uh, of the region of Mexico. A lot of the detail on how they will work and whether there will be some uh, sorts of, uh, of uh, auctions conducted to, 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 to make sure that the projects are built by CFE, it will be included in the market rules, which should be published by the end of this year as a draft document and which will be open for comments from private uh, participants, from the industry, from everyone interested uh, throughout uh, the first months of 2015. So there will be a good time for, for the details to be uh, uh, tuned up and, and decided upon, but the, the basics of the systems are, are the ones that I just explained. Thank you. Let me just say that this is one of the most extraordinary and, uh, and pleasing elements of the energy reform is the process by which it's being conducted, which has been highly interactive, putting ideas out for comment by industry, by civil society, etc., and actually listening and being willing to change course. Uh, and I think that, that you know, to see that going on as, uh, as long as possible is very, very encouraging to investors around the world. You know, and the conversations that, you know, that we have with the private sector, that's what they're telling us. Is, you know, it's so good they're doing this because it's not as common as you might think around the world. Most countries, and Mexico in the past, have said, we're going to do this and that's that. those are the rules. This is a willingness to listen and to incorporate comments, which is uh, incredibly encouraging. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our time here uh, of this first annual North American Energy Forum. Um, I'd like to, uh, to thank all of our panelists, in particular, of course, John and Undersecretary Hernandez, uh, for being here with us. I'd like to thank the help from the Embassy of Mexico, uh, from the uh, Embassy of Canada, um, my staff here at the, uh, at the Mexico Institute, Angela, Victoria, Pedro, Juanita, um, Adalberto, um, of course, uh, Megan from the Canada Institute, and of course, the, uh, the director of the Canada Institute, uh, David Biet. Thanks very much. It's been uh, a lot of fun working with you. Thanks so much for coming here, and we hope to see you again next year.